welcome to the show where we share the stories of the many who intersect with our healthcare system but are rarely heard from. My name is Kevin Poe, founder and editor of Kevin MD. Today in the show, we have Matt Dixon. He is a healthcare executive and he wrote the Kevin MD article, Why Now is the Time to Get Patients Back to In Person Routine Care. Matt, welcome to the show. Glad to be on. Thank you for inviting me today. We'll get into your article in a little bit, but first off, can you share your story and journey to where you are today? Absolutely. So I've been involved in healthcare since I graduated from college many years ago. I won't, I won't share the, I don't want to date myself specifically, but really most of my career I've been focused on helping payers, the, the signals of the world, um, really focusing on overpayments, appropriate and proper payments. Uh, really right before this, I was working on analytic models to identify motor vehicle accidents, for example, from paid claim data and got a wonderful opportunity to come work on the other side of the equation, which to me is really the more exciting side, which is really focusing on tools and technology that helps patients navigate their journey and helps providers connect with those patients. Tell us some misconceptions because as physicians, you know, we don't know what goes on behind the scenes, especially when dealing with payers. So with your experience and work on the payer side, what, what are some misconceptions that clinicians need to know about or need cleared up? Well, I guess uh, there can be sometimes maybe a little bit of an adversarial relationship. I, I think that uh, at the end of the day, I believe their intent is to make sure that the money being spent in the healthcare system is focused on the things that um, really matter the most, right? So in my instance, for example, in my previous experience, again, focused on motor vehicle accidents is to ensure that the guy who ran the red light was paying your medical bills as opposed to your, your health insurance payer. So, you know, I, I think that again, the, the, the focus is in the right place, uh, whether that happens in practice all the time uh, is in, in great question. But I, again, I think the idea there is, hey, let's make sure the dollars are being used in the most impactful way. So you switch from working with payers. Now you work with patients and clinicians. Tell me some of the challenges that um, you face in making that, that shift. Well, I think it's a lot of the focus uh, in our article. You know, I, I, as I made that change, I thought this will be easy, right? I have come from writing these predictive models that do very, very hard things. I mean, discerning an MVA from claims data is very complex because the injuries mirror what you'd see from any number of other kinds of issues, back pain, for example, or somebody were to slip and fall at home, that looks very much like a motor vehicle accident. It's really the challenge of not, not only communicating, but communicating in a way that creates patient activation. That, that's the biggest challenge in, in the space and, and certainly has been something I've been really focused on and, and, and certainly has been a, a difficult part of the transition. All right, let's talk about that Kevin Emily article that you wrote. It's titled, Why Now is the Time to Get Patients Back to In-Person Routine Care. Now, for those who didn't get a chance to read your article, can you just walk my audience through it and share the story of why you decided to write it? Reason behind writing it is something we've been tracking for quite some time. So as the COVID pandemic uh, started to uh, come to fruition and real have a, a real impact on the way we deliver health care, we kind of look to some of the past to say, well, what are the long-term impacts going to be outside of just COVID, right? Mm -hmm. So we look back to the 2002 SARS epidemic and said, how did that impact people's long-term health uh, that aren't necessarily people who uh, were diagnosed with SARS, but were impacted by the shift in the way healthcare was delivered during that time? And what we found or saw was particularly around diabetics, if you looked at hospital admissions for diabetics, those plummeted during the SARS epidemic and then not only rebounded to previous levels, but went up and above where historically you would have seen those hospitalizations uh, take place. So you saw this real knock-on effect uh, with long-term chronic conditions, um, not only going back to where they were, but being even worse. And we're seeing that unfold kind of in real time here in America as well. So the National Cancer Institute just came out and said that they anticipate 10,000 more deaths over the next decade due to cancer than what uh, historical trends suggest. 
a Lancet study just came out that is estimating anywhere between an eight and a nine in percent increase in uh, deaths due to breast cancer up to year five after diagnosis. It's even worse for colorectal. They're anticipating anywhere between a 15 to 16 percent increase. So we're seeing these knock-on effects already starting to happen or being anticipated. And really that's been the onus or the genesis of the article is to say, hey, there's an opportunity now to uh, aggressively intervene to get people back in for these diagnostics, uh, their yearly visits, so that we can uh, hopefully unravel some of the damage that was done by people delaying care during the pandemic. Now, do you have any data suggesting that cancer screening, routine diabetic screening, they've gone down certainly, but do you have any data in terms of how much they've gone down during the pandemic? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we actually saw some of this data coming out of um, the CDC uh, in conjunction with Medicare and Medicaid runs their early prevention uh, program. And they just came out and said that in April of 2020, it was down 90% over the five-year average. So certainly some of that has uh, rebounded uh, quite a bit, but there was a time where we're seeing up to 90% reductions. I don't know if you're an NFL fan or not. Mm -hmm. If you are, at least in my area, you can't avoid the commercials where you're actually seeing them talk about this uh, um, quite a bit, uh, where you're having ex-NFL stars and coaches saying, look, cancer screenings, especially for at-risk communities, really took a nosedive during the pandemic and how important it is for people to again, kind of get over that fear of, well, if I go to the doctor's office, I might catch COVID and really address the much bigger issue or problem, which is if you don't, you may have cancer that isn't detected, isn't detected early. And we all know the importance of early detection and that may have an an even more serious long-term impact on your health. So I know the COVID pandemic is a once in a century phenomenon, but I was wondering, can you extrapolate some data from the SARS uh, pandemic that you had mentioned earlier? You did mention a delayed diagnosis and diabetes leading to increased hospitalizations later on, but extrapolate for that data, what can you expect f- uh, in terms of numbers of delayed diagnoses of cancer due to these missed screenings? Well, and I think some of those we just touched on. So certainly I'm, I'm not in a position to extrapolate that, but we did talk about the Nancy, National Cancer Institute mm-hmm. study that has 10,000 additional deaths over the next decade. Lancet is telling you that you're looking at a, you know, a roughly 10 to 15% increase for some types of cancers. So we're talking about, you know, if you look at the Lancet study, you're talking about hundreds of thousands of cases when you talk about, you know, a, a, anywhere between a 10 and 15% increase. National Cancer Institute is being uh, a little more cautious in calling, and I, I hate to say this, but just 10,000 additional deaths, but certainly, uh, and I think the good news there is it hasn't happened yet, right? So this is why th- that article and the timing of that article for us was so important, because I do believe there's still a, a uh, a real opportunity for clinicians to intervene and, and help stem some of that tide. So let's talk about some of those opportunities. Um, you did mention some NFL players on commercials, bringing patients in for cancer screenings, but let's talk specifically, what are some of the opportunities clinicians can use to bring people uh, into the clinic for cancer screening and other health screenings? Yeah, I think first and foremost, you know, communication is the core of all of it. So first and foremost, I think that what you're seeing is that there's still fear uh, for individuals out there uh, around catching uh, COVID, right? So this is preventing them from coming in to get those screenings. So certainly there's a lot of importance that needs to be placed around communicating what you're doing to keep those patients safe. Uh, protocols you're using, for example, uh, some clinicians, for example, maybe uh, having people use separate entrances and exits, right? All the things you're doing to keep them safe. I think communicating that is critically important. I think the other thing that's important when we talk about opportunities to really intervene is we've seen a very uneven response, right? After the, the pandemic has gone through its ebbs and flows. In some areas, I'm sure that your audience are completely overwhelmed and have so many people coming in that they don't have enough 
diagnostic tools available to them uh, to complete those screenings. And in other areas, I think you, you know, what you're seeing is a lot of idle uh, equipment used as part of those diagnostic screenings. And it requires two different responses. The first, where you're overwhelmed, the question is, what are you doing to ensure that the right people are coming in? Because really what's happening in some of those areas is the people that are most at risk sometimes are the ones that are most challenged to come in and, and complete those screenings. And now we're creating an access problem. So these mm -hmm. highest risk individuals are calling up or you know, trying to get those appointments and they're finding their months and months and months out because those spots have been taken by people who maybe are a little lower risk, but don't have as many challenges coming in uh, to receive that care or that diagnostic test. On the other uh, part of the equation is uh, areas or regions where they just can't get the people to come in, right? Mm -hmm. so now you're talking about a much different type of communication. And again, I think the underpinning of that is ensuring people that they're safe and then also reiterating them. And you saw this in these NFL commercials, reiterating to them that while yes, there is always a risk of catching COVID, there's things you can do to mitigate that risk as you engage in the healthcare system. But more importantly, the bigger risk to you at this time, especially for high risk groups, is that you will have undiagnosed cancer, for example. Uh, you know, I don't want to just talk about cancer. Uh, certainly anybody who has chronic conditions like high blood pressure, for mm -hmm. example, uh, and diabetes, as we talked about with the SARS epidemic, uh, certainly they're at risk as well and, and really need to recreate uh, that connection with their physician uh, and really reconnect in a way that ensures compliance with their care plans. Now, can you share a case study or a story of a specific clinic or hospital that implemented some of the ideas that you're talking about to bring patients back and, uh, and get them back on the screening horse, so to speak? Yeah, absolutely. So um, one of our clients uh, started a very aggressive colorectal campaign. And what they did here, and, and, and I think they were smart about this, is they use that risk assessment, right? So they really focused on the people that were at high at risk. And what they, really the approach they took was getting outside of this blanket approach. And I think this is one of the challenges we're seeing out there is people are just sending mass or uh, blanket communication mm -hmm. via email that just goes out to everybody who fits very broad criteria. They really focused in on the individuals that were at high at risk and what they did uh, was they used uh, actually uh, live voice agents to make outbound calls, right? So at the end of the day, we're trying to A, create a human connection and B, more than anything, um, trying to answer people's questions about their safety, right? You can, it's very hard to do that, I think, in an email. It, it becomes so long and cumbersome if you mm -hmm. try to do that via email. You're typically going to get people hitting the delete button or catching spam filters, so having that ability for them to, uh, for those agents to assuage those fears, right? Where, well, I would come in, but, right? Or I'm really worried about this. Well, let us tell you what we're doing uh, and, and why uh, some of those fears may be unfounded or the ways we're mitigating those. So they were able to see, um, and many of those people, uh, uh, unfortunately, I guess, fortunately had gotten their screenings, but had done them maybe elsewhere mm -hmm. outside of that health system. But they were seeing, you know, 20, 30% of the people that were being connected with were actually uh, scheduling those screenings in real time. So certainly we've seen uh, some, some good results by using a really human-based approach to this. And that may not make sense financially to do uh, for everybody you have that has high blood pressure, right? <laughs> That's such a large number, very difficult to do those kind of approaches, but certainly in uh, specific areas where people are at high risk, uh, it, it may make sense to use a more sort of aggressive uh, approach to ensuring they get in and get those screenings done. We're talking to Matt Dixon. He is a healthcare executive and he wrote to Kevin M. the article, why now is the time to get patients back to in-person routine care. Matt, what are some of your take-home messages that you want to leave with the Kevin MD audience? Well, I think that uh, really, you know, at the end of the day, all effective patient communication, and that's really what we have to focus on, right? You see a lot of focus on how to communicate with patients using technology to do so. 
But really the question is how to make that communication effective, right? So that it creates patient activation and adherence. And I think the, the grounding part of all of that is all effective communication is humanized communication. People want to feel like that communication was specific to them and just not part of a, a very broad outreach effort. So again, things like risk scoring so that you use different content uh, based on the amount of risk uh, that a particular individual may have for a certain condition. Uh, certainly uh, understanding that you need to do some A-B testing of communication. So we see often people will send an email, for example, and then if they don't get a response, they send the exact same email again. Mm -hmm. Uh, different people are motivated by different things, right? Uh, and, and understanding that you may have to change the content of that message to activate uh, people who are motivated in different ways. Uh, I will say the thing, though, at the end of the day that I think is really an important take-home message for your audience is really all good communication, like I said, is human-focused. Our, our survey, we did a survey recently in 2020, 54% of patients said they felt rushed during a doctor's appointment over the last 12 months, that number has come down in 2021 to 41%. But for you to be a patient, caring, compassionate, understanding in your communication certainly requires you to take care of yourself. And I, the other thing that I think we're seeing that is concerning to, to me when we look at the data is that physicians are reporting uh, burnout. It really, the numbers have been quite alarming. Uh, matter of fact, the uh, survey just went out from uh, the Physicians Foundation. They surveyed roughly 2,500 U.S. physicians and 61% reported experiencing burnout often. Mm -hmm. That was a 53% increase since 2018. So I would encourage your audience of clinicians certainly to take care of yourself first because I believe that really truly is the foundation of effective communication. Matt, thank you so much for sharing your time and insight and thanks again for being on the show. All right, thank you for having me. Mm -hmm.